Hi, it's Rob. Just a quick note before we start this show. This episode and every episode this season is sponsored by Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform. There are so many things you can do to help support how brands are built, like leaving a rating and a review or signing up for the newsletter. But one of the biggest things you can do to help is check out our sponsors like Squad Help. And if you get the chance, let them know I sent you. Thanks. Here's the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. This is season four of How Brands Are Built, where branding professionals get into the details of what they do and how they do it. I'm your host, Rob Meyerson. Thanks for listening. I first heard Dr. Jason Chambers' voice on 1A, a podcast from WAMU that's distributed by NPR. Dr. Chambers is an associate professor of advertising at the University of Illinois, and he was on 1A to talk about, for lack of a better phrase, racist brands like Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben's, and the Washington, D.C. NFL team. I was excited to talk to Dr. Chambers in a little more detail about these brand names, where they come from, why they should change, and how to change them. Dr. Chambers is also the author of Madison Avenue and The Color Line, African Americans in the Advertising Industry. So I also wanted to get his take on diversity in the agency world. I believe this is the first time I've interviewed a professor on the show, which makes sense since this podcast mostly focuses on people doing brand work. So don't worry, I'll continue talking to quote unquote practitioners on most episodes. But I had so much fun talking to Dr. Chambers and exploring his depth of knowledge on these subjects. I hope this isn't the last time I host an academic or professor on the show. I'm eager to hear what you think of this episode, so let's get into it. Here's Dr. Jason Chambers on how brands are built. Dr. Chambers, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. So you're an associate professor of advertising at the University of Illinois. So I'd love to just start by asking a little bit about your career path. How, how did you decide to, to study advertising and the history of the advertising industry? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. Excellent question. Um, the reason why I, I got into advertising, actually, all of my degrees are in history. I've never actually worked in the advertising industry. And so my kind of path into studying advertising came from an interest in African-American business history. So looking at African-Americans as entrepreneurs and owners of various kinds of businesses. Initially, I didn't focus in on advertising, but as my graduate career wore on, toward the end of it, I, I um, gained more interest in studying the history of consumers and why people bought things and how people bought things and what kinds of arguments were used to get people to buy things and how those arguments had changed over time. And that naturally led me to a greater focus on advertising. And so then for my, for my dissertation and my, my focused area of study, I combined that interest in kind of consumer messaging and African-American business enterprise. And that led me to my first book, my dissertation and which subsequently became my first book, which studies African, American entrepreneurs and business owners and executives in and within the advertising industry. So African Americans, not so much as subjects of advertisements or within advertisements, but as owners of agencies and creators uh, behind advertisements. So let's talk a little bit about that book. It's it's Madison Avenue and the Color Line, African Americans in the Advertising Industry. Um, can you just tell a little bit more about kind of how, how you went about conducting the research that went into that book and, and give the listeners a little bit of an idea of what they what they'll learn reading that. Sure. It's a combination of archival research, so going to various archives around the United States, in North Carolina, in Wisconsin, in Chicago. So it's archival research combined with um, interviews personal interviews that I conducted with people like Tom Burrell, who was an African-American ad man, legend, pioneer out of Chicago, individuals like that. And it looks at our history in and within advertising, going back to the 19 teens, uh, because I wanted to see, okay, what was the first instance that I can find of an African-American who called himself or herself operating an advertising agency? And I let them define that. I let them use their own terms rather than, you know, kind of looking back at a business myself and saying, well, that was an advertising agency, even though they didn't use that term. No, I wanted to find as far as I could, that first instance of somebody operating an advertising agency. And so that took me back to the 19 teens. And then I just traced that story forward of African-Americans efforts to diversify the advertising industry. So it 
ties together elements from media, so looking at African American owned magazines like Ebony and Jet and how they tried to acquire advertising. So it kind of combines that story of African-American media with African-American uh, efforts at being, becoming entrepreneurs and agency owners through, you know, through and throughout the, uh, the 20th century. So it, it looks as well at you know, governmental activities, so the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission, so federal government involvement, local government involvement, primarily in uh, New York and Chicago and a few other cities. So it really tells that, tries to tell that broad story of African Americans' efforts to gain a foothold and a place and success in advertising from about the 19 teens through about the early 1990s. Uh, late 1990s is where I kind of ended the story. Got it. How do you how do you characterize where we are now in the agency world from a diversity standpoint? I, I don't know if there's a way to quantify it or just qualitatively speaking. How are we doing from a diversity standpoint? Quantifying it is difficult. For, for a variety of reasons, one of the things that's many things, of course, that have happened is, you know, when you get into the early 1970s, when we first begin to see the, the emergence of the concept of the holding company, right? Prior to the holding company, your, your, your advertising agencies were independent, mm -hmm. right? Leo Burnett was Leo Burnett. BBDO was BBDO. DDB was DDB. Now they're all Omnicom. <laughs> Exactly. Well, when they're all independent, and that's a wonderful point, um, when they're all independent, well, then, the, you know, the business can make decisions or the company can make decisions without any oversight. You know, you've got the obviously you've got the oversight of your board and you've got the oversight of your owners. And you're if you're publicly held, you're in business to, you know, to help make money for your shareholders, of course. But you can act as you define yourself as needing to act. If you're, you know, if you're, again, if you're Leo Burnett, you do what you do in Chicago and DDB is over here doing what they do over in New York. So with, you know, when you have that, you've got more availability of numbers. You know, if you go back to the early 1970s, you can see, you know, advertising agencies, for example, publishing their numbers on diversity. Now it's done under pressure. Yeah. But you can go back and see that in advertising age, right? These are, you know, this is Young and Rubicam's mm -hmm. numbers of African-American employees in its New York office. So that information was widely available, or at least broadly available, relatively speaking. Well, now at the holding companies, finding that information, gaining access to that kind of data, even on that, even in that cursory level, is very, very difficult. Right. Right. It, it's, it's nigh on impossible. That's one of the interesting things that I'm waiting to see of our current moment. And here I mean within the last few weeks and months of 2020 with a number of agencies saying and making public pronouncements on, hey, these are our numbers. Hey, we need to do better. Hey, this should be different. Well, I'll be interested to see, one, what numbers get published and how those numbers are broken down. If there's some, you know, are they kind of sublimated to the mass of the holding company or do we get really granular detail right. for each agency within the holding company? Because if a, if a holding company, for example, just publishes its percentage of, you know, African-American or minority employees or underrepresented groups, um, well, if we don't know where that's at, all those people could be at one agency, and I'm being facetious for purposes of making a point, but it could all be at one agency. We don't know. So I'll be interested to see how granular we get with that detail, you know, now that we exist primarily in the business amongst this, excuse me, or within this holding company model, right? right? And that's what I'll be interested to see. And I'll be interested as well to see how consistent is it. From holding company to holding company, you mean? Or, or how consistent across agencies within a holding company? Across agencies. Yeah. Yes, because, you know, not, not every agency has stepped up and made a public statement, right? But a number of them have. And so from those that have, you know, okay, is it just the 2020 thing? Is it just an August 2020 thing? Or, you know, are you going to be on a consistent schedule that every year we're going to be able to track and tell and see how you have done. I mean, advertising age, I don't know if you saw advertising age today, but advertising age, age today essentially had a, uh, an article on, well, why change hasn't worked. The article is essentially about why social change hasn't worked in the advertising agency business. Right. And what was the takeaway? Uh, the takeaway was from one of my colleagues, the ad industry really doesn't, doesn't really want to change. Mm. Right. Uh, here it is. 
uh, ad industry activism isn't working. You know, excuse me, why ad industry activism isn't working was the name of the article, title of the article, headline of the article. And it's essentially because the advertising industry doesn't want to change. Right? That's takeaway. And, you know, my, my rejoinder to my colleague who, who brought up the article to me was, well, you know, wow, we've spent an entire few weeks <laughs> trying to change and well, nothing has happened. So let's just, right. let's just go on to other. Bits. Yeah. For someone who's researched this going back to the, the 19 teens, <laughs> a few weeks can't feel like a long time. Yeah. I mean, all of this, stuff, it, it, it all takes time, right? It all takes time. I mean, we've seen a spate of hiring, you know, we've, you know, and I don't say this with any, with any critique or criticism inherent in it, but you know, we've seen the hiring of chief diversity officers and equity officers and the like. So, I mean, you know, depending upon what people are able to do from those positions, that's the opportunity for change. But it, it just struck me is a little bit disheartening to kind of be a few weeks into this, so to speak, and we're already, you know, writing articles or asking the question or addressing the point of why it's not working. Mm, yeah, good point. Um, well, it would be nice to yeah. to see some of the uh, pronouncements that these agencies have made. Um, uh, like you said, to see what happens over the next months, uh, next couple of months and years as to whether they are really going to act on on these statements. Well, yeah, because the thing is, you're, you're not just talking about a change in the, the numbers of people and the numbers of employees and the groups of people that you have in and within your agency. You're talking about an, an overall culture shift. Yeah. Right. You're talking about a change in culture. And anytime you try to change that, that's extraordinarily difficult and time consuming because it's, it's asking you to change a lot of things that you don't even realize need changing. I mean, and it takes time. Heck, I, tr I tried to change the other day from using the Chrome browser to Safari <laughs> because I, I, I heard Safari had on Apple had, had better privacy protection. <laughs> well, after a couple of weeks of it, I was just like, you know, this is, this is just, I, I just don't like to change. I've been using Chrome forever. And I just went back to Chrome. It was just easier to keep doing what I was doing. Why? Because it was just taking me too long to make the shift. Well, it's, 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 it's one thing if I just kind of sh shift back to what I was doing, it's just a private citizen messing with his, his, his web browsers. It's another, if I say I'm trying to change the culture and environment of my agency, let alone my industry, that takes a lot longer. Right. But the point being that there's, there's inertia here inherently. And so maybe the, the headline of that article shouldn't have been that it isn't working, but just that, and, and maybe the takeaway shouldn't have been that the industry doesn't want to change. I, I guess I, I don't know whether or not that's true, but it sounds like what you're saying is either way, there, there's going to be inertia that's going to make it difficult, even if people do want to change, and it's going to make it take quite a while, potentially. Yeah, and, and uh, absolutely. And unless, unless people see the monetary reason for it, it's the kind of thing that without organizational impetus, mm. that is the kind of thing that eventually will, you know, will fall by the wayside because we're not making a monetary argument about it, right? Yep. And without that, it, it has the potential. I'm not saying that it has, you know, that was my colleague's kind of um, cynical takeaway that, that the industry doesn't want to change. I think that I think that that's probably a little bit too far. And that was probably, a, you know, Monday morning cynicism getting the best of them quite, quite, quite fairly. But, you know, it, it, it inertia is a thing. I mean, it takes it takes a lot to turn a big ship, as they say. Right. Yeah. This episode of How Brands Are Built is brought to you by SquadHelp, the world's number one naming platform. Here's how SquadHelp works. You launch a naming contest to engage hundreds of naming experts. You're guided through an agency-level naming process that goes beyond traditional crowdsourcing. The platform uses AI and includes name validation features such as audience testing, trademark validation, linguistic analysis, and quality scoring. And SquadHelp doesn't just do naming. You can also use their platform for taglines or slogans, as well as logo design. To launch your naming contest today, go to squadhelp.com and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. Squadhelp, company, brand, and business name ideas by experts. Well, speaking of things that um, seem to take too long to change, one of the other just broad topics I wanted to get your take on, and that's been in the news a lot lately, is these brands 
like Aunt Jemima and uh, the Washington football team that have really relied historically and I guess currently to, to, to some degree on racist stereotypes or, or imagery. I, I just wanted to get your take on sort of why, why these brands exist. Um, <laughs> and I, I understand that, you know, racism exists. And so that's part of the answer. But, you know, why do these brands use these these uh, stereotypes and, and imagery to begin with? And then to your point about inertia, you know, why has it taken so what seems to me so incredibly long for, for them to change, despite in many cases, decades of, of pushback from activists? Sure. Well, I think a couple of reasons. Let me take the first part of your question, you know, first, which is, you know, why use these symbols at all? Well, symbols are simply shorthand, right? Mm -hmm. they, 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 they're they like a, a logo or a trade character. It's a way for consumers to, you know, to recognize my brand in the marketplace without me having to take, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 paragraphs. If we think about when these symbols were created back in the world of print advertising, even before radio becomes a thing. So these symbols become shorthand, the, 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 the stereotype about the group of people for which the symbol is being utilized, in this case, African-Americans. Well, even with on, within all of the racist tropes that have existed about African-Americans then or now, there are certain areas at which African-Americans are stereotyped to be good at, mm. right? Stereotyped to be expert at. Right. If we just kind of sat back and just off the top of our head listed stereotypes about African-Americans, whether well, good at sports, particularly basketball, they're fast, they're tall, um, they're good dancers, they're, 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 they're good at music. So we could list categories of life or areas of operation, which we the stereotype, though it exists and is racist in and in aspects of it are racist in and of themselves are taken to be perceived to be good at, right? right? Sports and the like. Cooking, if you turn the clock back to the, the, the early 20th century, late 19th century, cooking would have been one of those for, for African-Americans as well, right? I see. You're, well, they're, 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 they're good cooks, right? So you combine that stereotype of good cook and expertise and service and authenticity and quality. Well, if I've got a quality cook who has a recipe, pancakes and we've been able to mirror that recipe in the box and then we surround that in the wrapper of a of an old black mammy in the old south who served her famous pancake recipe to not quite the slave owner because at the time it's created slavery is over but this kind of white master in the old south kind of model well that that stereotype that sense of authenticity that sense of that sense of quality that's conveyed in that idea it's conveyed to the brand itself. And then we, you know, we wrap the rest in the story of, you know, kind of the old South and all of that um, kind of foolishness. Uh, and then you can, you can see the same thing for other brands, you know, Lando Lakes, um, butter and margarine. If we want to convey the quality of our ingredients, well, we utilize this, this native American image, because who are the people that are, that are closest to the land and the, and the greatest, you know, you know, really typify this sense of authentic connection to manufacture and the making of an, of an agricultural product. Right. Right. Well, it's, I can simply use Native Americans to convey that kind of natural imagery, this kind of connection that I want to make. Um, and it, 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 it works the same way for a lot of different groups if you go back far enough. Right. You know, I talk about this in one of the classes that I teach, um, you know, back when the persons of you know, Scottish ancestry were the stereotype about them was that they were penny pinching. Right, that they, they they didn't like to spend, or they know the they knew the value of a cent, if you will. Well, a bank might want to use that to, to 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 convey their financial wherewithal. Or if you think about a brand like it still exists, Old Dutch Cleanser, mm -hmm. right? With the stereotype being Dutch people are so hyper clean, <laughs> right? They're just hype, they're fastidious about their cleanliness. So we you know we use this 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 image of this old Dutch person. It's primarily a woman because the character trade characters in a, in, a, in a dress. Old Dutch cleanser has the same is 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 so is is of such quality that it's that it's favored by these persons that we all know to be hyper clean and fastidious about their their cleanliness. So the, the stereotypes they become the shorthand for um, for advertising and for marketing. Um, and, in, and in almost every case, I assume. I mean, this is probably going to sound like a, an ignorant question, but it's not uh, it's not a, a, a Dutch company that created that brand, for example. This is primarily um, 
companies run by white people selling to other white people, but but trading on these stereotypes to to try to appeal to those mostly white consumers um, to to get them to think that the product has certain qualities. Yeah, that that's exactly right. It's a kind of ethnicity as as authenticity or ethnicity as as quality. Um, if you will. And so we, we utilize that uh, to, to attract a consumer for the same reasons that we strive to attract a consumer at any time. You know, I'm trying to get you to pause in that 5, 10, 15, 30 seconds, you know, that I have you long enough, you know, from my, from my advertising and marketing message to get into your head. So you make the decision I want you to make when you go to the store, so to speak. It's just that I happen to, to utilize the shorthand in this brand, in this example, I happen to utilize the shorthand that's based around racial and ethnic stereotypes. Right. So, so why has it taken them so long to change? Because it seems to me that uh, I, I get that maybe decades ago, maybe a hundred years ago, that was seen as more acceptable by the culture at large in the United States and maybe other parts of the world. But it, it seems to me that for the majority of my lifetime, a, a lot of people have recognized the offensive nature of a lot of these brands. And so why, why don't they change? And I suppose part of that is inertia, like you said, and part of it is, is just money, <laughs> but why don't they? And then, and then now it looks like a lot of them are, or, or maybe will be, um, as a result of recent events. So what do you think keeps them from changing? And then if this is a tipping point of some sort, why now, uh, as opposed to any other uh, time? Well, I'll give, I'll give you an answer based out of two areas, money and people. Right. The money is a simple answer. Let's go with the people first. Okay. Think about it this way. Um, most businesses, if you're, if whatever you're doing is working and you're meeting your goals and financial goals, let's say, if you're meeting your financial goals, you don't really have reason to change. Right. You know, if you're selling all the donuts that you want to sell, then why, you know, why change the recipe, change the recipe for what, right. Maybe try to change to, to, to save money, but outside of some external impetus, you don't have a reason to change how you're doing business. So think about a large corporation like a Quaker or a PepsiCo or something like that. If you're the, the uh, I'll just use the clumsy phrasing of the, you know, you, you're, you're the brand manager, mm -hmm. you're the marketing manager. Let's say you want to change, you know, you, you come to the company, you know, hoping, you know, you're going to work on the engine, I'm a brand and the like, and you want to change. You don't necessarily like it, but you know, it's effectiveness, you know, it's success, you know, that it occupies most of the space on the store shelf of the, you know, the pancake mix aisle, pancake waffle mix aisle and the like. So if you don't have a reason to change who, you know, what person who wants to keep their job is going to come in and say to their, you know, to the company, Hey, I know we've got something that's working over here, but for these social reasons, I think we ought to change it. That's a pretty quick way to probably find in yourself on the way out the door, <laughs> right? Because who wants to change what's working? And for a lot of companies, particularly ones with decades old brands and a lot of stability in the area in which they operate, in this example, pancake mix, you don't have a reason to change because you're not going to change your marketplace and space that much. If anything, you probably look and say our greatest danger is probably losing space. So you don't want to be the one to walk into the meeting and say, hey, let's take a chance and let's lose space, yeah. right? Let's lose consumer loyalty. I always go back to a quote from a businessman, African-American, excuse me, it was an African-American, uh, an advertising executive who worked for the Ted Bates agency back in the 1960s in which he was being asked about or he was responding to questions about essentially how the company was responding to the calls from civil rights activists for change and the like and so forth. And so he said in a moment of, of what I like to think was candor, he said, you must realize that the businessman doesn't wish to antagonize anybody, even the bigot. Right? Wow. My job, what I want to do is I just want to sell stuff. So if you keep the people part of it first, you don't want to, if you want to keep your job, unless you have an external reason or a financial reason for calling and pressing your company to change, you're probably going to leave it alone because you're meeting your goals, right? And as long as you're meeting your goals, everybody's happy. Then that gets us back to the money part. If the money part is still good, if the money part's not changing, again, if you're meeting those financial numbers, then what external impetus do you have for change? Well, you could change the formula maybe to save a little money, but that doesn't change the name. 
Well, you could change the packaging some way, but that doesn't change the name either. Well, you've made the adjustments to a trade character. You kind of made those a couple of decades ago. You know, you took off the handkerchief and the like. You've still got this African-American woman. You've still got the name. So the money has to change, and the money can only change in a couple of ways, the leading which of one of which is simple consumer desire not to purchase your brand anymore. And when you have to respond to that, then that changes things, or you get a unique social moment like what we had this summer, mm -hmm. right? You get a unique, a unique social moment around which people of varying demographic considerations, race, age, geography, education, all the things we might use in a basic demographic breakdown seem to be united around a, a similar idea of anti-racism. Right. right? Anti-stereotype, particularly as relates to African-Americans. What's in, in, the, in the advertising and branding world, you as, as a brand like Aunt Jemima, you stand as one of the leading examples of, of being offensive. Right. Well, now, instead of having that person who wanted to make the change all those years ago, walk into the meeting and say, we should change this successful brand, the successful trade character, you know, for financial reasons, those don't exist. But now you've got social reasons that exist that are also obviously tied to money, but you've got social reasons that exist because you've got people saying, I'm not going to buy your brand. You're an example of things that are wrong in this country. And then you've, then you've got the power to make those changes. Do you, I know it's too soon to, to tell, but do you worry at all or, or, or think that some of these companies have said that they're going to change these brands but they're, they're obviously trying to get out ahead of this, right? Some of them came out quite early, it mm -hmm. seemed to me. <laughs> well, very late in many respects, but shortly after George Floyd's mur murder and, and some of the, the protesting online, this, there was almost like dominoes of these brands saying, we're going to get rid of this brand or we're changing it. Um, and yet <laughs> I was in the grocery store a couple of days ago and, and Aunt Jemima is still on the shelf. So clearly they, they weren't so mm -hmm. concerned that they recalled it or anything like that. <laughs> Do you wonder if they're just floating this and sort of saying it because they recognize that they could be in a little bit of hot water if they don't, but then they're actually going to follow the money. And if they don't see a dip in sales on this brand, they may renege on that offer or, you know, what, what's, what's really going to happen here? Do you, do you expect these brands to disappear? I think if we, if, if social media didn't exist, then yes, if this was a moment that was driven or reliant, I should say, that was reliant on traditional media, then yes, because if it was reliant on significant attention from the New York Times or Washington Post or Fox News or whomever else, some major media entity, well, as we know, the, you know, the news day and the news cycle and headlines change every you know, it's not even every 24 hours anymore. Back from back when CNN started, it's a lot faster than that. Yeah. So if it was obviously, so if it was reliant only on that, then I could, I would, I would say, well, yeah, maybe because, you know, then we, you, you'd be, you, you would need those major media organs to kind of keep their eye on that particular ball and, you know, bring it back before consumers again and again and again. You don't have to have that anymore. I mean, things like your podcast shows that. You can have, a, you know, individually, we love the phrase influencers now, you know, people can have influence well beyond the major mainstream media. People can follow other people. I can, I can, I can make my grocery list dependent upon somebody that I follow on YouTube, right? right? You know, how, how to, how to go grocery shopping and be a non-racist. Yeah. And it doesn't, it, I, I didn't have to read the article in the, in the New York Times. I simply download the list of, of brands to avoid. And then I go through the grocery aisle and I, I don't buy those things. And so it doesn't have to be a national mass organized, mass media driven thing anymore. It can be driven by a few individuals um, and interested parties and groups on social media. And they don't even have to all be united together and speaking about this on a Zoom meeting, coordinating activities. No. You know, I can just get, you know, the thing can just be trending on Twitter yeah. or something like that. So, so without that, then yes, I would worry about it, but social media allows the attention to remain on the topic, even when it has disappeared from the, um, you know, from the mainstream media, you know, when ad, ad age and ad week, for example, if we just think about the advertising trade press, when they're no longer covering it, social media keeps it up. Yeah. You know, blogs keep it up, podcasts keep it up, Facebook keeps it up, Twitter keeps it up. Um, 
TikTok. <laughs> Keep that until it gets banned. Until, until it gets totally banned, right? right? right. Um, TikTok. TikTok, TikTok keeps it up. So people can keep it, in other words, in front of people and continue to hold brands, you know, the feet of brands, specifically those that have taken a public position can continue to hold those brands feet to the fire, so to speak. Right. Because, you know, in contrast to another brand who didn't say anything, you took a public position right. and now we're simply going to hold you to what you said you were going to do. Right. You referenced, referenced this a moment ago, but you know, we've been saying these brands haven't changed soon enough, but but pretty much all of them have changed. They just haven't gotten rid of the name. So I, I think you mentioned that Aunt Jemima's image has changed significantly over the years. I, I know and I've read articles where you can kind of see the evolution and they added pearls to her and, you know, I, I guess tried to make it less offensive. Mm-hmm. Do those steps have any value in your mind? I mean, is it, is that, should we think of that as a good thing that they were at least trying to do that or were they just delaying the inevitable, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on that kind of shift? And I'm especially curious because now this Washington NFL team has said that they will change their name. And it seems like one of the leading candidates, at least if you believe what you see on social media for the new name is warriors, which to Mm -hmm. me feels like still a, it's a less of an explicit reference to Native Americans, but perhaps still trying to kind of um, implicitly reference that old name. Um, and so I just wonder, mm-hmm. you know, is that actually almost worse when they kind of try to just um, continue doing what they're doing, but make it less offensive versus just making a clean break with with that offensive imagery or name? I'm I'm one who argues for the clean break. Right. And and what I would say about Aunt Jemima and her transition, and I don't have its its initial year in front of me right now, but that transition at least took place I'm in terms I'm remembering here rather than pulling it out of out of my research. Um, it feels like that took place right around the time I graduated from high school, which is about nineteen which was nineteen eighty eight. So it took place somewhere I would have to believe in the <clears throat> late nineteen eighties, early nineteen nineties. So it definitely was not a, it didn't take until the 21st century for that change to happen. So their, you know, evolution of her, if you will, worked has worked in the marketplace for the better part of probably two and a half to three decades or more. Right. So your, your, your gradual change was enough for consumers up until 2020. And again, that might be as much as three decades or more. The, the the Washington football team is a little different. And what I would argue is that because you've been so resistant, so recalcitrant to it, I mean, in contrast, even to something like Aunt Jemima within the recent past, you know, nobody was, you know, to my knowledge, nobody was out picketing, you know, the Quaker, Quaker or PepsiCo headquarters. Right? right. But you've been that you had that you've been the, you know, the leading kind of sports team of all of them. And heck, I'm at the University of Illinois. Our brand, our, our mascot for years was a native a person dressed in Native American, you know, faux Native American attire. Right. right? Chief Illini Weck was his name. And so our university got rid of him and others, you know, St. John's, the Redmen, and, you know, you've got all of these other sports teams that have said, okay, we're done with it. We're stepping to the side and the like you though, are the example and have been the example of the only one who never really even approached it from the standpoint of, well, we'll talk about it. We'll analyze it. We'll think about it and quietly wait for it to go away. You are essentially, especially since Dan, when Dan Snyder um, owned the team, never, not going to happen. Forget about it. My team, my way. So you don't have the latitude of even being gradual because you have been so resistant for so very long. Right. Right. You haven't been open to any conversation whatsoever. So with that, I would say, you know, you want to step as far away from it as you can, you know, you need to Washington, I don't know, lightning, call yourself (laughs) something, but get away totally from that you know, from that association, you can keep all the colors, of course, you can keep the red, the gold, the white, you don't have to change all that, but step away from the name and just say, you know what, we're going to make a clean break so that we can get out of the news for this in any way, shape or form, because there's nothing, um, it's not bringing anything good right. to our brand. Right. Right. And, and we should mention that, you know, you said money is what often drives this change, at least as I understand it, what, what finally pushed them on this is FedEx uh, who sponsors mm-hmm. their stadium saying that they were going to 
basically take their name off the stadium and no longer sponsor that unless the name changed. Yeah, and I, and I love that that that, that letter um, from FedEx was, was such a wonderful example of the corporate iron glove, <laughs> excuse me, iron hand in a in a velvet glove, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, you, you know, you guys can do whatever you want. You know, you run your own business, but this is what we're going to do. It's like, well. <laughs> You know, that, that essentially tells you that the writing is clearly on the wall and your, your, you know, your time is up yeah. because, the, because the, the other, the other thing is, and I'm going to say this really quick, yeah. if a company of the size and scope and visibility of FedEx lead, it's not perhaps that you can't get someone else to put their name on the stadium, maybe, but are they going to have that kind of attention and they're going to have that kind of money? No, because no company of that size and that visibility is going to want to follow FedEx if you don't change. Right. Right. And, and while it was the money that drove um, uh, the NFL team, uh, presumably FedEx was motivated by this cultural uh, awakening, I guess, for lack of a better term. I don't, I don't know that they that anyone was calling on them to do this necessarily. I, I suppose probably in some quarters they were hearing that. But like you said, I don't think people were um, boycotting FedEx or anything. I think they they saw that they probably did, as many companies probably and hopefully did, some kind of audit on, you know, do, do we have any kind of associations with something that we shouldn't be associating ourselves with? And so they, they saw that connection. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, it's, it's a kind of exposure, right? Because if, if we can see it, right, we're in Toronto, we're here at FedEx, we're, you know, kind of, we're a publicly held company, publicly traded company and like rather, excuse me, if we can see it, you know, activists, and I'll use that term as broadly as possible, they can see it too, right? right? And they, they understand pressure points. That's why in the 1960s, for example, you know, African-American civil rights organizations, they didn't target advertising agencies first in their pressure for change. They targeted their clients first. They went to Procter & Gamble, Colgate, Palmolive, Lieber Brothers. Um, they went to them and said, you know, maybe you can't tell another business, another, in this case, an agency, what to do internally. But you do have some control based on your money. And we have some influence over you, Procter & Gamble, based on our money and our ability to take action as consumers, right? So if you're a company like FedEx, it's, it, you, you have to read that like, if we, if we are exposed, sooner or later, somebody's going to call us on it as well. Somebody's going to go to the, you know, the, the, the Redskins external partners, and they've done it before, but you, know, you didn't have social media to help drive it. Somebody's going to go to their external partners, Nike, uh, mm-hmm. NFL, uh, you know, stadium rights owners. Right. They're going to go to all of them and say, why are you doing this? Right. Um, so we've alluded to this quite a bit throughout the conversation, but I, I want to ask directly, you know, we saw the, the, the day or week of black squares on Instagram and companies coming out and making statements of solidarity or donating to nonprofits. Um, we did see some companies, to a point you made earlier, starting to to publish some data around um, the diversity of their of their employees, um, and some even make commitments around how they were going to change. But other brands were accused of kind of coming out and saying the right things, but not really doing anything or, or not having done anything to really back up those statements. And I guess I'm just curious. Should brands do brands have a responsibility to speak up? Um, and support racial justice and and related causes, um, you know, at, at, at sort of flashpoints like the murder of of George Floyd or, or just in general or, or not. And I guess I would kind of compare this to what we see happening in the NBA right now. And, and of course the, you know, the, the refrain from, from some, um, size of the debate is, is the, the shut up and dribble refrain, right? That these people should just be athletes and stop talking about politics, um, and I certainly don't agree with that point of view, but I wonder if people might say the same thing about companies and, and even if business owners might say, you know, Hey, I don't want to get into politics. I just, I'm here to sell soap or, you know, whatever it is. And so mm-hmm. I'm not going to take a stand on this one way or the other. Is that a, is that a fair case for, for business owners to make? Should consumers accept that from brands or do brands have a responsibility here? You know, I'll, I'll answer that. Th- I'll answer that this way. Do you remember when you know when 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 COVID and it's after the first several weeks and and people were asking Dr. Fauci about you know how long is this going to last and so forth? And I'm paraphrasing the conversation, but Dr. Fauci essentially said the virus sets the timetable. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I I can't tell you 
you know, COVID is going to have to tell us. Coronavirus will tell us how long it's going to be around and how long we're going to be dealing with it, so to speak. And I, par- you know, my parallel to that is I don't think necessarily that a business by itself decides, but I think its consumers can. Right. And what I mean by that is that your consumer base will tell you their expectations and you can follow them um, or not, because people increasingly want multiple reasons and multiple touch points with which to engage with a company. And, you know, over the last several years, we've seen concepts and ideas around social justice or politics or the right way, what, what, you know, and I don't mean that in, in its political right left sense, but the, the right way to address a topic is your consumers are telling you right. and you can either respond and go with those consumers or be left behind and be left by them as they go to find a brand that better matches, that better matches their outlook. And I think that that's driven by a number of things, not the least of which is that the world of consumer products is pretty much available to all of us pretty much all the time if I'm willing to wait. Because if it's not on my store shelf, if it's not immediately accessible to me in my community, I can order it and I can have it shipped to me. <laughs> and, I can supp- and I can support another brand. I can take the action, go through the effort, take the time to support another brand that does better reflect my values. And that's what we've been seeing over the last several years is consumers increasingly wanting to support right. brands that support their values. And so your, your consumer base, and back at Ken DeFauci setting with coronavirus setting a timetable, your, your consumer base to some extent will set your social outlook and your, you know, where you have to fall as a company on issues of, in this example, on issues of social justice. And if you want to keep that consumer base around and not try to build another one, then you better be prepared to respond to them. Right. It's kind of like what you said, the FedEx letter said, uh, you know, it's, it's up to you. It's your business. And I suppose every business owner has the right to act or respond however they see fit. But it sounds like what you're saying is given the trends, it's not even just about your political beliefs or, or or anything like that. It's also just about smart business. And so if you recognize that the trend is in the direction of consumers caring about um, the brands that they associate with or associate themselves with, then it would be wise to maybe not only react to to how consumers um, are seeing your brand, but maybe to get out ahead of it and and start to make any changes that you need to make to ensure that uh, you won't be in the position that some of these brands we've talked about today are, where where they they've seen as uh, not only having racist origins, but having taken far far too long to uh, to react to 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 change those. Yeah, and and, and that's, that's exactly right. And and consumers. And the, the, the support of consumers gives the people that are in these companies perhaps the latitude to do what they've already wanted to do. They just haven't had the support. They just haven't had the power. They just haven't had the influence or the arguments to be made on, on their behalf. So, for example, um, you know, for all I know, people at FedEx wanted to do this a long time ago, right? Because the company is just made up of people. FedEx as a corporation, doesn't make a decision. Right. The company doesn't make a decision. If nobody shows up at FedEx tomorrow, unless they've got, you know, an AI that's operating the company, <laughs> nothing happens, right? Packages don't get delivered. Nothing happens if, if the people aren't there. So people at FedEx, and we sometimes forget this with companies and corporations, where they're all just in it for the money. They're all just right-leaning and right-wing and money, 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 money. no. They're made up of people who perhaps have wanted to do something, have wanted to say something, but for marketplace reasons, haven't been able to. Well, now that those marketplace reasons have changed, social justice, what have you, now I can do what I've wanted to do. Now I can say what I've wanted to say because now I have the the political, the social, the civil license to say it. And now I can perhaps impact the change that I've wanted to impact for years. That's a really same thing with Angela. Yeah, it's an interesting take and and kind of an optimistic one. It's, it's nice to think that I mean I, I know you're you can't say for sure, but it's nice to think that some of these organizations maybe wanted to change for a long time and and actually saw this as an opportunity. Of course, I'd, I'd like it if more of them had, had pushed harder to do it sooner. But still, um, I'm happy that that some of them are taking the chance, taking the opportunity to do it. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, Rob. It comes from years of experience and interviews many interviews in which I've had people, um, people that worked at, have worked at agencies, client side things, people who said to me many times, you know what, turn off your tape recorder, 
And this is off the record, but I'll tell you how we think, and I'll tell you what I would want to do if I had the license. And so I know, you know, and that's why, that's why I try not to fall into the academic um, constant lambasting of corporations. Well, it's a corporation that must, that makes money and by law essentially has to do what's in the best interest of its shareholders. So therefore it inherently has to be evil. No, 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 it's, it's people, right? People with families, people with jobs, people with needs, people who need their salary, just like the rest of us. And I haven't been able to say this, but now that the environment has changed, Mm -hmm. now I can say it. Now I can use my position to say it because as powerful as I am, as the, you know, the CEO of FedEx, I'm still beholden to probably some pretty powerful shareholders too, right? But now I've got the ability, the license to say and do something that maybe they agree with or maybe they don't, but I can still get it done. Well, I hate that it had to take such such violence um, to, to have a moment like this, but I hope that a lot of these brands um, and companies do take this opportunity to do the right thing and that a year or two from now, we, we see far fewer of these brands on our, on our supermarket shelves. I have a couple of wrap up questions. Um, aside from your book, Madison Avenue and the color line, are there any book recommendations and, and bar, bearing in mind here that a lot of the, the listeners are not um, maybe as academically inclined, but practitioners, people within agencies or um, in the branding industry, anything that, that you, you've read that you think is uh, a good read for others? Yeah. You know, I, I think if you want to want to hear the story of, you know, this African-American in particular, African-American fight for agency within the, the advertising business, there's a book by Judy Foster Davis it's called essentially Mad Black Women. Mm-hmm. It's about the African-American women's woman's story in and within the advertising industry. Uh, there is a book called Desegregating the Dollar, which is by a gentleman by the name of Robert Weems. Uh-huh. And his book looks at the, you know, the focus over the years on African-American consumers and how those arguments have evolved um, and changed. And so any, either one of those two books would be a great start. There is another one called Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben, and Rastus by a woman by the name of Marilyn Kern Foxworth. And she talks about African-American symbolism primarily as trade character. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. So any one of those three would be great, you know, a great place to, um, to start. And then last question, is there, you know, we've talked a lot about um, diversity in the advertising agency industry. Um, we've talked about these brands changing and, and this whole social justice movement, hopefully within the, the world of consumer brands. I'm just curious, sort of related to that, is, is there a brand or an organization, um, whether it's in the advertising world or, or the branding world that, that you think is making a positive impact and that you would want people to, to learn about or support? You know, I, I, I really like what, if I just had to name one, I really like what Coca-Cola does. Mm-hmm. Right, Coca, Coca-Cola in particular, Nike um, goes without saying, um, but I think Coca-Cola does a wonderful job and has done a wonderful job here of late in particular in those, you know, kind of the images and ideas and support for the types of things that we've been talking about. I think that that, you know, that, that company is doing particularly well. And that, and that's, that's one I always use as, as an example. Yeah. Is there a specific aspect of the company or, or an ad or something that you're thinking of when you, when you think of what they're doing, right? Uh, I think that they, their, their ads over the last couple of years have done a great job in this total opinion at showing the differences of life that we all enjoy different things. For example, when it comes to tailgating, mm-hmm. right. Uh, you know, we all, we all have a different definition of what a, you know, the perfect food is or what goes on a burger or what goes on a, a pizza. So we, 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 we have points of disagreement about a simple thing. It's just a pizza, right? <laughs> it's not, a, it's not, it's not world changing, right. right? But you want arugula on yours and I want pepperoni on mine. So we disagree. So we disagree about a thing that's largely meaningless in, in the world, but then we have a point of, we have a point of commonality. Yeah. We have a point of agreement, right? No, it's, it's, it's the brand, but it's back to that idea of, you know, to me, it ties to that idea of, okay, yes, we're unified, our commonality in this commercialism about Coca-Cola, but in the world, our commonality is, you know, no matter what we do, unless you know something I don't, for example, there's only one planet for the rest of us, for all of us to live on. <laughs> unless, that, we're, that, unless we're that, Elon you Musk. Know, <laughs> hey, you know, Musk, you, you, you know, we're all going to be taking an you know, the Musk shuttle to Mars in a minute, I guess, but 
you know, un- until that happens, you know, while we all have chips in our, you know, buried in our brains, um, <laughs> until that happens, this is it, man. Yeah. And, and, and so the earth or, or the fact that we're human beings is our point of commonality. And I, you know, my reading of the text of the Coca-Cola advertisement ties to advertisements ties to that, yeah. right? Even within all of our difference and difference as there are points of commonality for us. And I think that's a nice message in our, in our, in our you know, oft too oft divided environment. Absolutely. Well, uh, just for the record, I don't like arugula on my pizza. Um, but <laughs> I also <laughs> want to say for the record, it's been an absolute pleasure, Dr. Chambers, having you on the show, getting to learn from, from your experience and your research. I uh, thank you so much for, uh, for your time and, and for sharing some of your insights. Well, you are quite welcome. I enjoyed it. Thanks again. Thank you, Bob. You have a great day. You too. Thanks for listening to How Brands Are Built. To hear more from Dr. Chambers, I encourage you to check out that episode of 1A I mentioned in the intro. The episode title is Reckoning with Racist Brands. You can also find his opinions in publications like Ad Age, Ad Week, CNN, Forbes, Black Enterprise, and The New York Times. And he's written two books, Madison Avenue and The Color Line, which you heard us talking about, as well as Building the Black Metropolis, African American Entrepreneurship. And of course, you can find him on the University of Illinois website, as well as LinkedIn. Hey, if you're enjoying How Brands Are Built, I'd love it if you'd leave a rating and a review and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And swing by HowBrandsAreBuilt.com for additional content like blog posts, a branding newsletter, how-tos, definitions of branding terms, and Q&A sessions with designers and strategists. How Brands Are Built is a production of Heirloom Agency, LLC. Our logo and original podcast artwork is by Joel Sherlow, with additional design work by Lacey Honda. Web development by Matias Garrido. Our theme music is by Isha Erskine Project. I'm Rob Meyerson, and I'll talk to you next time.